Okay, hello everybody. Um, if you've not seen our first presentation on the ancestry of COVID, please take a look at that. That'll give you some good background on uh, this topic. Um, so since that um, video was circulated, many people began to ask me, well, have you considered this being bioengineered? Uh, we had a lot of discussion about um, COVID perhaps being in circulation long before December, January. Uh, and we should be clear, COVID is the disease, not the virus, and it may not be the exact virus, but we think there might be something similar enough to it that there might be some antibodies out there. Um, so the next question is, well, you know, doesn't this go counter to any sort of bio bioengineering effort? Well, uh, I do want to take a look at this. Uh, there is a video that is circulating um, that has a lot of views, 1.57 million views. Uh, on the origins of coronavirus, and it has some claims that perhaps this was made in a bio level four facility in the in um, in Wuhan, uh, and so I want to examine some of those uh, to understand is this potentially um, human made. Um, now, uh, some biases. Okay, I am in general a very anti-war individual, and I believe many of these wars get started on poor evidence. Uh, weapons of mass destruction comes to mind. Babies in incubators. Gulf of Tonkin. Long list of of wars being rushed into with shoddy evidence. And so um, there's an old scientific saying that for extreme conclusions, you need extreme evidence. And let's just see whether or not this video actually has that extreme evidence it's looking for. Now, it's a long video. There's a lot of information in this video that I am not qualified to certify or, not, or, or debunk. I'm a, I'm a person who knows DNA sequencing, and I can't even read the languages that half these papers are, are written in. So the only thing I'm really qualified uh, to comment on here, not being an epidemiologist, but being more of a, of a genomics um, background, uh, is I can comment on whether they're doing the genomics correctly or not. And if they're not doing that correctly, then I'm not certain I trust anything else that's in the video. Uh, so uh, let's have a look at what's there. Uh, before we do this, let's just give you a little bit of background and sum up um, some of the features that were in the last video. But perhaps we didn't, we didn't throw out a lot of these statistics. We just suggested that eh, maybe there's some prior history to this. So some things to consider. 90% of patients, this number varies based on the test and based on the jurisdiction, but around 90% of the patients that meet testing criteria, that means they have to have the symptoms of COVID and they have to have been within a certain distance of COVID in some jurisdictions, okay? Or someone who tested positive for COVID, okay? 90% um, of these people are negative for the RNA that's in SARS-CoV-2, okay? Uh, so that's really interesting, right? These patients have symptoms and have yet to be, ex uh, you know, and have been exposed. What is this? Is this some other virus we don't know about? Is it a rhinovirus? Is it a flu virus? Uh, what are these other people that have symptoms um, but don't test positive for COVID? Could, could, could the false negative rates be that high? I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that they've been recorded to be that high. So there's something else in the population that's masquerading as COVID. Could be another coronavirus that has differences that our primers don't pick up. We don't know yet. We needed a lot, lots more sequencing to figure out if those patients graduate to become extremely symptomatic and to the point where they need ventilators. I don't think we have good studies on that yet. Maybe some of those will come out shortly. What we've also seen is a very high asymptomatic rate. Um, and this varies as well by jurisdiction, but the numbers are significant in that there's a lot of folks out there that are PCR positive but have no symptoms, okay? Uh, this changes the epidemiology of the disease, but it also might suggest maybe these folks have some antibodies that were familiar with a previous form of this and uh, can clear it. Um, this is, again, speculation. We are also beginning to see high levels of IgM and IgG antibody counts. Now, I want to caution all of this data is for headlines from articles in the news, and this isn't peer-reviewed, so this can be sensationalized. Take it for what it is. We'll start to get some peer review in this shortly. Uh, when we start seeing these papers end up in bioarchive, they'll get some public scrutiny, a lot more than just journal or just just you know news articles. So, but what we are seeing is 14% have antibodies in Germany, 70% had them in Italy. Now Italy got tested very late in the epidemic, and so that number could be elevated because we got there a bit late in surveying the antibodies. And then likewise, um, Chicago uh, was, was uh, there's a, there was a news article in Chicago about 30 to 50% of an antibody counts in Chicago. Okay, so this is, a, this is a substantial portion of the population that already has antibodies, and we need to know more about this. Um, this could imply there are previous versions of COVID that produced antibodies that circulated through the population but did not create um, the alarm that we're seeing with the current version of it, all right? So um, just to be clear, when we're suggesting there's another, there could be another ancestor here, we're not suggesting it's identical to the one that's causing severe disease today. It could be attenuated in some way, uh, such that it has a different source, 
uh, has a different timeline and has a different um, projection through the population as well. Okay, so that's what we we, we kind of know. And please see the ancestry um, that the, the first version of this video that we did um, previously. Okay, the other thing that's come out since we did that video uh, is that there are there there are variants in the ACE2 gene. This is the gene that COVID binds to in uh, on, on human cells. And if there are DNA variants in the human population, as rare as they might be, they may still be very important because this is a rare disease, okay? This does not affect everybody. It's, just, it's affecting a small percentage of the population in a very severe manner. And th those case fatality rates are in debate. They're as low as 0.15 up to 1.5%. They're, they're all measured a little bit differently based on who's in the inclusion criteria and who, what the denominator is. But um, they're trending in a downward direction as we begin to find more and more patients that have the virus but aren't sick, okay? So um, that being said, the very small number of people does hit, they may, we should be sequencing those people. Maybe they have some of the variants that are described in this paper um, that are anticipated to either increase susceptibility or decrease susceptibility, okay? Um, so this is a really important paper to better understand, uh, you know, who may be more susceptible than others, okay? Could be playing a role. Um, the other thing that came out of recent papers, and I'm not certain if this one's peer reviewed or not, so keep that. Uh, the last paper I don't believe is through peer review. There's a paper later that has been through peer review that we're going to touch on. So these are in various states of validation. Um, this was a sample, or I should say a study, that went to survey fecal matter, uh, the metagenomes of fecal matter. Okay, and the important term here is metagenomes. When you're sequencing metagenomes, you're usually using a hypothesis-free method. You're sequencing all the RNA that's present. It's very expensive because a lot of that RNA is not viral RNA, so you have to use a tremendous amount of sequencing capacity to do metagenomes. These are different because they are hypothesis-free. They do not rely on building PCR primers that are anticipating a certain target. When you do that, and all the PCR work that we're doing, has PCR primers that are anticipating the current SARS, um, current SARS sequence. And if those PCR primers have variants under them in the other viruses, we won't see them with those PCR assays. They will only amplify really the, the thing that's in circulation now and the thing that's in circulation before, they may fail to amplify, okay? So this metagenome pr uh, project was sequencing uh, many different, um, it actually just surveyed already sequenced metagenomes, and they just noticed that in data that's already in NCBI, there's evidence of coronaviruses, in fact, SARS-CoV-2, in samples that were deposited in NCBI in April of 2019, okay? So this needs a little bit more scrutiny because this um, paper is uh, is not through peer review, and of course, read mapping exercises with metagenomes is, can be tricky, um, so we, should see, we want to see some reproduction of this, but uh, this certainly implies that um, SARS has been here longer than we think, okay? Uh, and this is relevant when you begin asking about, like, was this engineered or not, right? If, if this thing's been circulating, well, who engineered it and when? A lot of the accusations I'm seeing is this was engineered in Wuhan and was released, and uh, I'm not so certain uh, there's evidence of that if there's uh, material circulating through the population. Um, now, can these things be engineered? Well, this is a bit of a newsflash for those who don't know, but the DNA synthesis field and the DNA modification field has gone through absolute revolutions in the last few years. We can easily synthesize a 30,000 base pair of virus. This is not a problem. This can be done over a weekend these days with DNA, and you can turn that DNA into RNA with a variety of different molecular biology tools, okay? Um, now, we can make these viruses such that they are 100% identical to Mother Nature and you would never know. That's the state of the art with DNA uh, synthesis technology is we've gotten to the point where we can make even entire bacterial genomes and they will be the same ATCs and Gs that you would find in a microbe in the wild and no one would know the difference, okay? This is what's known as scarless DNA editing and scarless, that term is used because the only way for you to discern between whether this was nature or man-made is by sequencing it and measuring the DNA sequencing profile to see if it's ever been seen before. That ever been seen before is very important, and we're going to touch on that in a bit. Okay, so CRISPR and DNA synthesis—it's gotten to the part to the point where this could be done. Now, predicting which edits to make, such that you could aim a weapon, has never been done, and and uh, particularly a weapon that doesn't backfire in your own population. Okay, so this is something that's near Herculean. So even though we can 
do these things and make these viruses, we do not have predictive ways to actually make viruses such that they could target a particular human set of variants that are within the population and project this upon one population versus another. That is fantasy land right now, okay? Um, so just some perspective there. Okay, so let's dig into this video and see what's going on. The video demonstrates um, a blast report that they did to demonstrate that these viruses were sequenced before and were from laboratory strains, okay? So if there are laboratory publications demonstrating human manipulation and they happen to match the viruses that are infecting people, well, that would be a big problem, okay? Uh, the evidence, though, that they put forward um, points to one particular query ID here. You can see this at 10 minutes and 53 seconds into the video. They point to this QHD43418.1. That's a DNA sequence accession number that's in NCBI. You can actually plug that number into NCBI and pull out what the sequence is, okay? Yeah. What was what was this and when was it submitted? Likewise, the hit that they seem to put a lot of emphasis on and they've highlighted here in the video is to a, another SARS coronavirus in the database. And that has a different accession number, the one starting with YP00972439.2.1, okay? Um, so they've got, they're demonstrating that we've got a DNA sequence here and we're trying to match it to a database. And the point of this was to imply to the viewer that a, that this virus that's circulating now matches a lab strain that was known in the past. Did they pull this off? Is this true? Well, let's pull out the query sequence. Okay, here is the first one that we mentioned with the QHD 43418. You'll see that this is a 75 amino acid uh, sequence. So it would probably code about 150 bases would code for this every three bases in amino acid. Um, you'll see that it is deposited in NCBI on the 18th of March, 2020. Uh, and this is not, in fact, a lab strain. This is actually a strain that was published in this paper down here in Nature as being a coronavirus associated with human respiratory illness. Not from a bat, not from a lab, but actually extracted from a patient. This is then suggested that it 100% hits this other virus, which is not a bat or a lab-derived strain, but is yet another virus that was isolated from a patient with a submission date of the 30th of March, 2020, okay? So what do we have here? We've got a sequence that was discovered on March 18th, was 100% identical for a very short stretch of 75 amino acids to a patient that was sequenced on March 30th. This has absolutely zero evidence that this was engineered, okay? This is just evidence that they blasted two coronavirus sequences that were recently sequenced to one another, got 100% hit and declared victory, not really knowing what they're doing, okay? So th if this is the grounds upon which they're trying to make the claims for this being a bioweapon, it's incredibly reckless. Now, with that said, uh, I believe in the First Amendment. I believe in people's freedom of speech, and I do not believe in a censorship community where this thing should be banned. Even though it's got 1.57 million videos, this is this views this is going to be a very helpful discussion for people to have and to learn about this. And we do not want to become the, the Communist Party of China here, where there is a czar of truth, and only the truth can get out through the political process, which is what delayed this virus from being known by humankind and is why we have what we have today. So the truth czar thing doesn't work for me. I fully encourage people to you know, publish these conspiracy theories and let people debunk them and debate them. Censorship's not the right answer here. But nevertheless, when you want to have very, very large claims that could lead to war, uh, you better not be doing the weapons of mass destruction thing because uh, then you look like uh, the same thing that you are so adamantly against. Likewise, the film also references this HIV homology paper. Now, this is a beautiful thing to see. I really encourage everybody to go to BioArchive and watch what happened with this particular preprint. It got published in BioArchive. You can see there's 126 comments on there. It got absolutely torn apart by the internet saying you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you did this, and it was voluntarily withdrawn like 24 hours later, okay? The authors recognized they made the mistake, agreed with the community, pulled the paper on their own. No conspiracy of somebody putting a gun to these head and making it get, get withdrawn. This was withdrawn by the author's own consent and admission that they made a mistake, okay? This is a common mistake people make with BLAST. When BLAST gives you a report of a bunch of things that are 100% identical to it, it doesn't sort them in any particular logical order. It just delivers them out of memory. And as a result, the top hit isn't always the rational conclusion. And HIV was in there. However, there are bat virus sequences in there as well that were equally homologous that they didn't see because they weren't on the first page, okay? So uh, this is a beautiful example of what peer review could and should be, which is 
hundreds of people and experts on the internet answering whether this is true or not in 24 hours. This would have taken probably three or four months to get through peer review and be debunked later. So this is a great thing to see. It's a great thing for film review. Uh, the film is relying on this uh, as one of their points of evidence of this having some type of engineering uh, attribute to it, and it just doesn't hold water. So let's strike two, um, where they're relying on some genomics that just have been thoroughly put to bed. Why is this happening? Well, um, Many people may not realize that this DNA sequencing field has gone through a radical transformation in the last few years where we now have portable sequencers. We've never had those before. So people can bring sequences into the jungle, they can go look at bats, they can look at Ebola in Africa. This hasn't been available until very, very recently. And so now what's happening as we go and sequence our, uh, the, the environment that we're in, we're seeing all types of, uh, uh, of things that, that would scare any hypochondriac. Okay, like this allegory of the cave is from Plato, where these people are living in a cave, they're constantly being shown shadows, and when you bring them out into the light, many of them run back into the cave because they're overwhelmed with new information. And that's what we're seeing here with sequencing being turned on. We're now seeing all the viruses that are flowing through our population, and we're not used to seeing those things. And some people want to run from it, okay? Uh, it may, perhaps not the shiny beach that you're seeing here, but instead it's loaded with cockroaches and microbes and all types of things that might scare uh, an individual the moment you start looking. But they They've always been there. Uh, and I think that's what's getting missed in all of the hysteria in the news right now is that these things didn't just evolve and come out of some Rick and Morty membrane. Uh, they've been here for a very long time. We've just been blind to them. And now we can see. Uh, here's an example of that. Here are more coronaviruses that are being discovered. This one is through peer review. And I think what's important about this one is in their first attempt at looking at this, they found four more uh, alpha coronaviruses and four more um, beta coronaviruses just in the first survey that they did. And they're referencing some work here suggesting there could be over 3,200 coronaviruses in bats, most of them which remain undiscovered. Um, they also did this study looking particularly at RDRP. This is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. This is an area where you might be able to get a mutation and not have it change the epitope tag, right? Uh, however, they were very clear to point out that they can do limited phylogenetic analysis with this. They need to sequence the entire genome of these things to see if there are, in fact, any mutations in the epitopes that might be driving our immunity. All right, so they state down here they want to look at the spike gene sequences to see if it changes the host range and if there are any variants inside that spike protein that make it more amenable to getting into <clears throat> the ACE receptor. What's been heavily studied in terms of there are lots of variants that were required to make the, the human leap there that made it so infectious. There's, I think, five out of six of the amino acids there. There's some type of furine ring that's involved that seems to make this be a really unique uh, coronavirus in terms of its infectability. However, this does not mean just because it's highly mutated that it was necessarily mutated by man. Uh, in fact, there is a nature paper I can point people to, uh, I'll put it at the end of this in the show notes or whatever, that uh, they've gone through looking at the, the mutations that were required to go from bat to human. And the types of mutations that are occurring are not nothing that any uh, tool that you would have used, a, a, a um, sort of codon optimization tool that you might use, would have necessarily picked this, all right? So this is, looks to be more naturally derived than something that one of our tools would have said, hey, shuffle these particular amino acids so you get this desired outcome. None of, them, none of those tools seem to have predicted what has actually come about. So uh, I remain convinced that Mother Nature is much better at doing this than, than we are right now. Despite the fact that we have all the tools to tinker, we're not very good at predicting the outcomes of our tinkering. And so it's far more likely that Mother Nature figured this out before we did. So uh, with that said, um, uh, I remain open to other data that might change this. There are more data could come in and suggest that perhaps this was in fact engineered. But at the moment, it seems to be a bit of a distraction. We have a pandemic on our hands and uh, pointing blame right now isn't gonna solve the pandemic any faster. In fact, it'll probably slow us down. Uh, so it's better we just figure out how to, how to address these coronaviruses and uh, do the forensics a little bit later. Uh, right now, most of those forensics are pointing toward this being naturally derived. Uh, not something that's that's generated in the lab. Um, I can't comment on all the other content in that video, just outside of my expertise land, but the genomics they presented uh, doesn't pass even a cursory sniff test. So hope this is helpful. Take care.